This is Jane Turner, FBI whistleblower, FBI advocate, and today we have three FBI whistleblowers sitting on this panel, all icons, all who have changed the Bureau fundamentally, and I'd like you to, uh, I'd like to introduce Fred Whitehurst and Robert Kobus, and they have some incredible stories. So first of all, let's start off with Robert. and. Uh, Robert Kobus, tell us your story about the FBI. Okay, my story is I worked for the FBI for 35 years. In my first 14 years, I was promoted 10 GS levels, and I also received nominations for two field-wide management awards. The reason I say that is because I want to show the people that are listening that I really do truly love the FBI. I loved my job at the time, and I really enjoyed the people that I worked with. Um, in 2001, my sister Deborah was killed on 9-11. And when I tell you the outpouring um, of support from my colleagues was just tremendous. And I thought, hey, this is gonna be a great career, gonna go along. And in 2004, my immediate manager came up with an idea that he wanted to give people time off without charging them either vacation time or sick time. In my mind, it was like a no-show job. And I said, you know, that was wrong. So basically, I, I started for almost a year. I went back and forth, and they didn't want to hear it. And in 2005, um, what happened was new executives arrived. I contacted them, and they really didn't want to hear it because what they did, which was I'm still shocked, the first thing they did was they threatened to fire me. I don't know for what reason. I'm the one that's bringing the information to, the, to them. They transferred me to a deserted floor, and that was among 130 empty desks. They assigned two FBI agents to come out to drive out to my house, 35 miles from the office, to retrieve a six-year-old bureau car. And they really just wanted to send a signal uh, to me and the office is like, don't bring up issues and problems. You know, and it's really, what really hurts the most is uh, for example, my mother was dying in a nurse, nursing home after losing a daughter on 9-11. And they, it took months for them to approve an hour and 15 minute request for leave. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just, it just, it really hurt because this is a, this is the people that I love. And um, so I brought my case to the DOJ OIG and they concurred with what I was saying. And then it took almost six years for my case to go to the OARM. Um, and my case all the directors, starting with Director Mueller, was questioned numerous times about my case, and they did nothing. Louis Free, who I happened to meet when I was on a Mexican vacation in Los Cabos, Mexico, gave me his personal number. But when I became a whistleblower, when I called that personal number, he hung up on me. And Director Comey, who I met on June 5th, 2014, when I was telling him the story in his office, he shook his head and said that way he previously previously worked, I would have won an award. You know, and I was thinking, okay, great. He allowed me to see him. I thought it was, and with him, I was very disappointed because he gave a speech about me two years later and he called me Michael Kovas. He didn't even get my name right, you know, but you know what, what I'm saying to folks is out there is that, you know what? If you allow them to hurt you, um, you're allowing them. You can control. And you know what? I know I did the right thing. And uh, I don't want to talk too much. But for the taxpayers out there, I mean, these cases cost million, millions of dollars. Can you imagine millions of dollars on a, on a whistleblower case that's involving time fraud? I mean, that's where I kind of I want people to realize and finally, if you can, and yes, I'm sorry if I sound like a salesman, but Rosemary Dew, who's a phenomenal woman, supervisory special agent, wrote a book called Your FBI. It's on Amazon. Read it and read about the 15 
individuals like Jane Turner on this case, on this call, and Fred Whitehurst, they are phenomenally strong people, and we are surviving. But you know what? If you don't, you know, if you don't say something, it's just going to continue. And I'm sorry to take too much of your time, Jane. And I'll let oh, you no. I'll go. Oh, back. no. Robert, that's most fascinating. And one of the things I noticed about when you were speaking is a no-show job. Maybe some people aren't aware of that. I'm only aware of the fact when I worked organized crime in New York City, uh, we prosecuted that particular violation, no-show jobs. Why don't you explain, I, because now we seem to have something some, uh, similar between the FBI and organized crime. Would you explain what a no-show job is for our audience? Well, with me, it was, I worked in a command center. I was a manager of a certain group of folks. And I no noticed one weekend I had, there was an overtime request. And I asked, where was the person? Because the person is signed in. Were they not doing their job? And I was informed that my boss allowed them to take off. And uh, I had to fill that position with overtime. And I said, and in the FBI, now it's all computerized, but I believe it still has the same message. When the managers sign um, that all the folks were in, all the employees were in work. Um, they're signing it and they're certifying it. And that's where my problem was because there were people not showing up for work. And, uh, you know, it was, it was just wrong. And you know what? Another thing that really irks me is that I lost my sister on 9-11. Those two FBI agents that drove to my house to take a six-year-old car away, uh, that was assigned to me away just to just as a symbol, and this is while I'm serving in the military reserve for a week locally, I could have drove the car home. They could have been out investigating terrorism or any other matters. And that's where the focus has to be and is on executive management. Allowing these executives to dictate to these young agents to do things that were not ethical um, is wrong. So. Basically, mine's a very simple case. It was just both employees not coming to work. Excellent. And did you like that, uh, you know, it's organized crime does the same thing? They have no-show jobs? It's you know, I, I, hope not the F, I hope the FBI is better than organized crime. And that's where, you know, there are a lot of good people. Some of my best friends in life have worked for the FBI. And that's where the, the point, the, you know, it's very disappointing because as I said in an interview uh, once, 95 to 98 percent of the people are just phenomenal people. I have family members that still work in the FBI. OK, they're great people. But it's the yes. two or three or four percent of these executives that are really just looking for payday. You see, I, I realized looking back over the years, all it was was these uh, the FBI executives don't want to rock the boat because they're looking for their next payday when they get out. And sure, if they're good FBI leaders, they should be paid a lot. But you know what? The good leaders need to address because I'll, Dana, I'll pose one question. You know the book I'm talking about, Your FBI. In 15, there were 15 executive managers in each one of those cases, right? 15 employees, 15 executive management. Did one help? Did one say you did the right thing? I don't think they did. No. No, and I, and I totally agree with you, Robert, that executives are the problem. And in my case, it was executives who took the actions which caused me to be constructively discharged from the FBI. My uh, matter started, of course, when I was working in Indian country. And I was reporting the fact that some agents were not uh, working these cases and in fact were putting, up, putting them under car accidents. So even though I had a doctor who wrote to the FBI, even though I had people who backed this up, this story up, uh, the fact that uh, there were other FBI agents that were covering these cases up, <clears throat> management in Minneapolis FBI office uh, decided that they didn't want the Bureau embarrassed. And in fact, that is uh, what they wrote on my papers when I was constructively discharged was the fact that I had embarrassed the FBI. Uh, I, 
you know, I went on because I thought that got placed back into the Minneapolis office and then reported theft from ground zero of artifacts. Here again, uh, executives sprung into action. We had a big case here in Minneapolis that I was working at the time about theft from artifacts. So I knew the value of them and we were getting ready to charge people. And when I brought this to their attention that we had artifacts in our own office and not only in our office, but throughout the country in FBI's uh, offices, uh, here again, executives sprung into action and uh, that's what started the termination papers. Mm -hmm. And of course they couldn't put down that it was because I was speaking truth to power that I was speaking the truth about stuff. They had to invent, uh, which was soul crushing like you, Robert. And it, it, it was this fact of having worked with many wonderful uh, FBI agents the facts that executives could extinguish the best and the brightest was soul crushing. And uh, let's find out, uh, and, and in my case, what did change my whistleblowing was the fact now they have put out a mission statement saying, you, you cannot pick things up from crime scenes. <laughs> now, you may wonder why that wasn't there originally uh, I guess they just didn't expect FBI agents to pick things up from crime scenes. But now there, there is a mandate that you cannot pick things up. Um, they also changed um, the transfer policy up in Minot. Uh, uh, no longer do they leave people there for 14 or 20 years. They get them out after a certain amount of time. But let's talk to Fred Whitehurst, who is uh, truly a hero. He has suffered the slings and arrows of the FBI. And he has been an individual that has never turned down a phone call from any FBI whistleblower in his life. He is kind of the mecca for FBI whistleblowers. They come to him. He spends time on the phone. He did it with me when I came uh, with my problems. And he is just an icon. Fred, tell us your story because it is unbelievable. Well, it's believable in light of what you all are saying. Um, I went into the FBI, spent four years in the field, got transferred to the laboratory. I have a doctorate in chemistry. Um, so I naturally should have gone back to the laboratory after spending my time in the field. And um, I got to the lab and it wasn't a scientific laboratory. And so I spent a number of years um, cleaning um, lab, trying to make difference, bringing in equipment. Uh, and after a while, I got, I got concerned about people were being harmed. Defendants were being harmed by this bad work product that was going out of the lab. Uh, my colleagues around me, good FBI agents agreed with me. Good FBI employees agreed with me. Um, there was one particular fellow who was, who, you know, caused me concern. And then it sort of blossomed after that. And what I ran into is something that both of you all are talking about. The promotion paradigm at the FBI has built a management that is very much like organized crime. Um, you will have nobody embarrass them. You will not, um, they've got qualified immunity. They can do anything they want. They get in your way. And they're probably the, the largest group of cowards I have ever come across in my life. And I'm 73 years old. They're terrified of exposure. And uh, so if somebody like you, Jane, or you, Robert, or, or Mike German, or whatever, if you come forward, it doesn't matter how good a career you've had. It doesn't matter what you've done. You've run into um, essentially the FBI mafia. And uh, they're sitting up there without any accountability. They're not doing the job. They're not encouraging. But if you, if you represent a threat to them, um, it, it's astounding what they'll do. You know, they'll send you to the psychiatrist and they'll send you back. They will try to take their weapon away from you. They'll try to take their clearances away from you, whatever it takes. Um, I did a very good job when I was at the FBI. I dedicated 
everything. You know, I was there 12, 14 hours a day in the lab. I was there on weekends. I was in FBI laboratory for three Christmases, Christmas days. Um, and that didn't matter. When science got in the way of these people's preconceived hypotheses about what happened, um, you were essentially, and I was told in words, um, you can use science to prove anything. Why don't you be part of the team? I think an important message is, though, all of us took an oath. We all took the oath. And we're either cowards or we're not. We're either going to hold our oath of office or we're not. You're caught in an ethical dilemma. FBI managers are criminals. They're running the FBI. We've seen that in national politics recently. They go the way the wind blows rather than the way the truth is. Okay? You can either take care of your family or, uh, and what do you say, abandon your oath, or you can uphold your oath of office and abandon your family. You can't have it both ways. So a whistleblower in the FBI is put in a very bad ethical dilemma. You know, so you're thinking when you're there because you're totally absorbed. That's the way FBI personnel are. You're totally absorbed in your job, the mission first and foremost. Um, you know, you get up from Christmas dinners and go get on an airplane and go someplace, whatever, okay? You, you are told all of these things about the right thing to do, but you better not do the right thing. Right. But you get this idea that the only thing that there is is the FBI. And I'm here to assure you that um, I've lived very comfortably since I got out of the FBI. The FBI recruits talented, um, well-educated, very dedicated people. And there's a place for each and every one of those employees in the public sector. There just is. For instance, uh, when I was at the FBI, I went to law school at night. And I've been practicing law now for 17 years. My wife and I didn't starve. Uh, my daughter went through, you know, college, has gone out into her successful life. Um, we don't live in a high income area. We live in a tiny little town in North Carolina, but we're very happy with that. But thinking that what else will you do is, is frightening. I know both of you all, Robert, Jane, you went through that. Oh, my gosh. What is there? Oh, there's life after the FBI. It's not going to be the life that the people that sold their souls for 30 shekels of silver are going to have. Those guys want those six and seven figure jobs that they've been given by their buddies before them who were given it by their buddies before them. They end up in, in um, oh, security systems, you know, for large industry or whatever. Okay. You know, they have a limited time on this planet. And at the end of that time, they have to pay for what they've done. The heartbreaking thing of this is that fraud uh, results in human rights violations. It results in people no longer trusting our justice system. It results in what we've seen in the last two years, thank God, whole communities of people saying, I don't know why it's true, but I know that my friends, many of them were put down innocent or guilty we know, for instance, my, my brother was at my house when they accused him of being a terrorist or something like that. Whole communities of people have riven up, risen up. They're saying, fix it or we will burn it down, and they are burning it down. And that, yes. in my opinion, is directly a result of management. It's directly as a result of the fact that management has lost its soul in our justice systems. And they are cowards. But Fred, go ahead. Fred, do you do you think it's true that uh, the management path in the FBI is centered around kissing up and kicking down? You know, if you give the right answer to the right guy to the right question at the right time, you get the right job, and that's the way it is. They come out and they ask us, "Do you want to be promoted?" And folks raise their hand. They don't come out and look at our records, our education, our ability, our capability of doing our jobs. They say, you want to be promoted. 
And one of the problems we have, Jane, with further, and I'm continue to investigate FBI laboratory malfeasance, okay, is that yes. the guy that I put in my place is going to cover my backside when I leave. And the guy that gets in this guy's place, they're going to cover, okay? But finally, maybe four transfers down the line, and that's about every two years those, those criminals are transferred, about every maybe fourth level down, he has no idea who's butt to cover. And so things start leaking. So you're talking about revelations coming in 10 year cycles where nobody's covering that guy that was here eight years ago because they don't even know him. That, what that results in for people who are innocent but put in prison is them having to wait 20, 30 and 40 years for the government to recognize. And I, and, you know, if we had time, I would start naming people that I know have been named as innocent that were put in prison because of the FBI laboratory's malfeasance. Yes. And the people that did that, by the way, committed the malfeasance are living high on the hog out yes. in, in the retirement arena, getting good retirement, and very often even being hired back as contractors by the FBI. So, um, fundamentally, after 25 years, I've been out of there. I came out in 98, 24 years. Fundamentally, when I, fundamentally what I see is the product promotion advancement paradigm at the FBI is fatally flawed. Yes. Fatally and, flawed. Yeah, I, could I, just I totally say agree with you. And Robert, um, tell me what you think about uh, the fact that all of our retaliation and the 15 FBI whistleblowers in Rosemary Dew's book suffered the same kind of retaliation. Don't you find that incredible that the story is the same Absolutely. for each and I, whistleblower? Uh, yes, and also I'm, I'm not gonna say the gentleman's name, but there was actually a junior executive in your case that was mentioned who later was a senior executive with me. And I, I don't wanna mention his name, but you know what? It goes to show you that obviously he did it once, he'll do it again. But there's another thing that I just yeah. wanted to say, and if any FBI supervisor sees this, you know, look, if you have children, what would you say? You know, there's a thing called bullying in the world. You're a bully. And you know what? Think about it. When an SAC or an ASAC goes and slams an employee or the 15 employees that are in this book, Okay, they are bullies. And you know what, society, as I understand it, you know, we're addressing bully issues, sexual harassment. Okay, read Rosemary Dew's chapter. Okay, would you, and I would go back to the FBI supervisor or executive, would you want your wife, your daughter, your mother to go through what Rosemary Dew went through? And I'm sorry, these things happen. Again, I, you know, I just want to get the message across that I'm not painting the brush of everybody's bad. It's like I said, the 95 that are good. But you know what? And I would say this to the FBI employees that are hopefully watching this video is that say something, do the right thing. Don't let them, you know, go. If you have anything, go to the DOJ OIG because you're covered, which that kind of leads me in one last statement. I'll turn it back over to you, Jane. It's just amazing how they have these laws where, and I use the analogy of a police officer walking the beat, a citizen runs over and says, hey, there's a fire, right? Does the police officer turn around and say, oh, I'm sorry, that's not under my, you'll have to contact the fire department. No, they'll act. And you know, what's very disappointing, but I think it's gonna come out eventually is that you didn't go to the right person. And so, you know, I, as I hear, and I've been out five years, that now you can tell your supervisor or your supervisor's supervisor that there's an issue. Because in my case, I knew if I went up the chain of command, they would have just turned around and said, you spoke to the wrong person. And it's really disappointing because you would think the FBI would want to know what's going on, not blanket. And if you look at the GAO report of FBI whistleblowing, I mean, like out of 80 cases, I think there were only like four or five, don't quote me with the exact numbers that went through and there were like 60 that they went to the wrong person. So I'm saying to myself, FBI employees are smart. You, need, you had to be smart to get on the job. 
you know, you have a passion to help people. You want to help society. I want to help society. I mean, in retirement, I'm a volunteer at a hospital right now, one day a week. You know, you have that urge. Well, guess what? Executives help the people that bring issues to your attention and don't be a bully. Excellent, Robert. And, and you know, we're going to close out with, of course, uh, the grandfather of whistleblowers, uh, Mr. Frederick Whitehurst. But I want to ask you a question, uh, Fred, which is the fact that the directors come and go. You, you've noticed this. I've noticed this. Uh, uh, Robert kind of mentioned it when he said the director he dealt with called him by the wrong name, but was still, you know, very positive about what he did. Um, but this cadre of executives underneath the director stay there. And they are the ones who kind of seem to adhere to the old Hooverite standards, uh, the sexism, misogyny, uh, retaliation against whistleblowers. Do you think that's, and, and they protect one another. There's no two ways about it. They all go through OPR, these executives. They all figure out that they're gonna protect one another up in those high high uh, levels. Do you think that that cadre of executive spread is just there, they're always gonna be there and they're not gonna change? My, uh, my student who became my partner at the Bureau said it this way, this is not gonna quit until all the old men go away. And then he said, and all the old men are not gonna go away. Mm -hmm. Jane, there's a way to clear the upper management out has to go down to the voucher section and pull all their vouchers. Every one of them. If you took a dime, you're going to get on the street. We're going to take you out of the building right now. You know these business where the special agents in charge come across the country and go to somebody's retirement party at government taxpayers' expense illegally and nothing yep. happens? Go, go pull all that out, everything. You, you get on an airplane, you get an FBI plane, you get vehicles, you get whatever. And do to those people what they do to their underlings, you know, misuse of a bureau vehicle or some whatever. Okay, pull it out and, and then just wipe them out. Just wipe them out. You know, the criminal um, element, if you will, is interested, they're greedy. They're interested in themselves. And you take a dollar, I, I, that sounds very simple, but uh, Robert Kobus worked in that, in that world. You say it's fine. Mm -hmm. You want to clean it out. By God, you took an oath of office. You're supposed yeah. to be an FBI agent. You're not supposed to bang your vouchers and bang your time and attendance sheets, which means steal off of them. You're not supposed to. And that's a simple way of reaching those people. I was surprised when Robert succeeded because he, yeah. I was complaining about that stuff for a long time. Nobody listened to me. But they had to listen to you, Robert. And, um, you know, this business of, of stealing taxpayers' dollars, oh my goodness. So will it, will it get fixed? They represent a national security risk, Jane. Yes. Those people will do anything for a dollar. Yes. They're a national security risk. So we either fix it or our adversaries in the world, and there are some, just run all over us. You can yes. buy an FBI executive with Chinese money, Russian money, Iranian money. You can buy one. And somebody needs to pay attention to that. Yes. You know, they ought to be just like the rest of us, like ministers. A vow of poverty. You came here for your nation, not yourself. But, um, hey, and it's going to happen. It will happen or we won't have a nation. No, that's it, correct. That's correct. You are straight on, Fred. And, 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 I, and I want to mention something. The AP recently got a hold of me uh, for a comment about sexual harassment in the FBI. And several of these stories are coming out about this power imbalance and how these executives and supervisors are hitting on their people who are working underneath them. And what the Bureau came up with as an answer to these sexual harassment problems is a call-in line for uh, people who have been sexually harassed. Jane, now, try that. You call in and you're, you're signing your death warrant. That's right. Th that's that's exactly. what they came up with. You yeah. think they're going to get anybody to call with a reputation those folks have got? 
that's like calling the mafia and say we know you're about to rob a bank you yes. know right. uh -huh. you know what they need to do now and you know maybe What's we that? can is they need to do it as an outside agency like the doj oig like michael horowitz at the uh, office of inspector general which i have a complete faith that he would do the right thing you know, we have to hope that as it's more of a diversity in the ranks of the FBI, that this will not go on. That hopefully through attrition, through people aging out, you know, let's just keep our fingers crossed. And, you know, I still am very positive that we, you know, our message and other people's messages. I mean, like I said, we already have a chapter two in your FBI because they have we have two. I know of two or, or three special agents that want to tell their story in the chapter, you know? And um, so, yeah, I, I'm going to be positive about that. I'm going to be positive that there are as diversity, as they get more diverse, that they will, um, um, I think it would happen. And I do apologize. I hope you're not getting this uh, on the recording. I have some phone, no, phone no, calls. You're, no, no, you're, you're fine, Robert. And Thank you. and you have a, a, a an excellent point there, and I I think for people who say who who are these three individuals that are up there slamming this institution that is so regarded and is a protectorate of the United States, I want to answer that because these three individuals, including myself, Robert Cobus, Fred Whitehurst, and myself have paid the price. We spoke truth to power. We were lucky enough to get probably the best whistleblower attorneys in the world with Cone Cone and Calapinto. Yes. Who were fearless against a, a, a government agency that is breathtakingly cruel. We had that going for us. We, we did speak truth to power and we have the right to make these statements because the FBI put all three of us through hell. Like Fred mentioned, you're talking psychological testing. You're talking about being made to sit in, a, in an area all by yourself. We're talking about isolation, being uh, uh, just subjected to the cruelest, most bullying type of kinds of things that you'll, a person will ever experience. So yes, we have a right to talk about the FBI and its shortcomings because all three of us have paid that price. Do you have any closing words, Fred? Oh, well, Jane, this morning I was interviewed by a young lady at Duquesne University who told me that in approaching me, she read some things about the FBI and her dream was to work in the FBI lab. And she said that after she read the things she read, that she's going to take a different path in life. That means that means that the things that we've exposed did make a difference. Yes. Now I encouraged her to go work at that laboratory, but not to expect her employment to go very long if she didn't agree with the bullies. But, you know, we have, we've, we've made a noise. The noise has been heard. We fulfilled our oath. We held to our oaths of office. And so- Yes, we did. I would close with that. I was an FBI agent. And, and you, were, you were a great one. Robert? And my closing is, I know both of you, the FBI is an organization. I still believe it's a good organization. We have to tweak it a little. But there, you know, there's an old saying about FBI family. And that's the one thing I never really understood because I have my own family. I have my wife, my daughters. Jane, you have your daughter. Fred, you have children. And what I'm saying is, is that those are the ones that are most important. It's a great organization when it works and, you know, proud to be, I'm still proud to call myself as a retired FBI operations manager. You know, I'm very proud of that. But you know what? I have my family and just take a minute when, when the executives, if they hear this message, take a minute, would you do, would you want that to be done to your child? Would you want, all I did was bring, like I said, no show jobs up. 
and I'm sitting on 100, around 130 empty desks. So just remember, take care of your own family. It's not the FBI family. And, um, you know, we are going to make it, we are going to make it better. I know as more people come on, more people have messages, hear this message, it will come on. Thank you. Excellent. And if anyone in the audience wishes to hear more of these stories of FBI whistleblowers or whistleblowers, just go to Whistleblower Network News and every week a whistleblower is highlighted. You will right. also have the book by Rosemary Dew right there that Robert is holding up, Your FBI, that has 15 FBI whistleblowers in there. The three of us are included. And uh, please buy the book if you can, listen to Whistleblower Network News. It was a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you so much. A pleasure to be with my fellow heroes. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you.